All right, so Acts chapter 7, one of my personal favorite passages in the Bible. We see the martyr Stephen, you know, just, just go, basically preaching this short sermon unto the Pharisees, right? And what I'm going to be preaching about tonight is, is essentially just this life story of Stephen, which we have very, very little of in the Bible. We're going to see, you know, because he dies right here, and the first time we see him is in chapter 6. Chapter 7, he makes his big, his big um, you know, sermon, his preaching, and then he's stoned, and he's dead, and he's a martyr for Christ. But what a great man for God. And we're going to go, th you know, every once in a while I kind of pick a character from the Bible, and we kind of go in, in depth on, on who they are and what they do and stuff like that. So tonight we're going to be covering Stephen. Now, if you're in chapter 7, just flip back to chapter 6. Because we're going to start looking at chapter 6. There's a couple things I want to go into a little bit before we get into chapter 7. Just to, just to give us the backdrop of this story, of, the, of this preaching that he said. Because char chapter 7 starts off with, Then said the high priest, are these things so? Well, what things? You know, we're going we're gonna to see what that's talking about from chapter 6. So in chapter 6, you know, in the book of Acts in general, we had the day of Pentecost in chapter 2. We had, we had the church just growing by leaps and by bounds. You know, people getting saved, people getting baptized. Real exciting time. You know, the, the apostles are speaking with other tongues, getting people saved in their own languages. And all kinds of excitement, all kinds of, of just, just great, you know, Christianity going on. Where people are, are just doing the work of Christ and seeing some great results. So in chapter 6, look at verse number 1. It says, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. So people are just, just you know, the disciples, people following Christ are getting multiplied. We have a lot of believers here. In Jerusalem, it says, There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So the church is growing tremendously. And some of the Greeks, right, not the Hebrews, but the Greeks that were getting saved and, and were joining the church, they're getting saved, they're getting baptized, they start to complain, they're saying, well, wait a minute, you know, our widows are being neglected. And turn, keep your finger here and turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. It's important to point this out because there's a few points I want to make about this. It is the church's job to take care of widows, to, to be able to support them. Because in, and in 1 Timothy 5, we're going to see all of the requirements that a widow has to meet, basically, to, to be a, considered a widow indeed. To truly be, to be considered someone that the church has the responsibility to take care of. Now, a widow obviously is someone who's lost their spouse, right? Typically, um, you'll see a wife has lost their husband. They can't support themselves financially. They were relying on their husband. And um, now that, that source of income is gone, so what are they going to do? Well, that's one of the, the, the purposes of the church, is to help take care of people like that. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, we see that. And, um, you know, so the Greeks were kind of upset. The church has grown quite a bit. And um, they're saying, well, look, our widows are being neglected. And notice this is in the daily ministration. This was a, a daily task for them to take care of the widows, right? To make sure that they're, they're taken care of. Look at verse number three. And this is going to tie together. I've been, and I'll let you know where I'm going with this in advance, just a little bit, because I want to touch on this subject real briefly. But just recently, I've gotten some comments, you know, about tithing and, and all this other stuff. And there's, it mostly comes from people who believe in this house church movement where they don't believe that you know that a church should meet in a big building which i don't quite get their point because our house is a building i mean we're meeting in a house but this is a building what in the world is the difference between meeting in this building which i happen to live in or meeting in another building that is dedicated completely to the church congregating in. And then I wonder, would it be any different if I were to, you know, if we were to rent out a big building or big, a bu big building for the church, and then I were to move in and live there? Right? So, I mean, really, what's, it, what's the difference? 
I don't get it. It's kind of a, it's kind of a stupid argument if you ask me. But there's this there's this growing movement and people saying because what happens is they see the truth of like this apostasy and a lot of these churches that you know they're just preaching for the money. They're doing all these bad things. So they're 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 making a blanket judgment. Say well all churches are just apostate and there are no good churches. We just need to just do this house church thing and that's what we're going to be. So they see a, a you know a, a a true trend that's happening with a lot of churches is just being, you know, teaching false doctrine and, and getting bad. But forsaking the biblical concept of church and the congregation, getting people together is, is foolishness. And they'll, they'll look at the book of Acts. And if you look through the book of Acts, you'll see, you know, Paul will be saluting people um, and in other epistles too, you know, the church in their house. Did people meet in, in houses? Yes, of course they did. And there's nothing wrong with that. We're starting in a house, you know. We're a small congregation. But a house can only hold so many people. Now, think about this. For Just to start off with, they were multiplying greatly. I mean, the church was growing tremendously where we are in Acts chapter 6. And to the point to where, you know, the Greeks are saying, wait, our widows aren't even being taken care of. This is a daily task, and it's plural. They're talking about widows. Now, how many widows do we have in our church? Zero. Okay? How many, you know, you think about just any average church. If you have a church that's around like 100 people or maybe 200 people, how many widows do you think you're going to have in that church? And then, as we read 1 Timothy chapter 5, think about how many widows now are going to be applicable to 1 Timothy chapter 5. So if you could think of that type of a ratio of, of how many members you have in your church versus how many widows need to be taken care of, Think about how big this church must be in order to even have this problem. Right? I guarantee you a church of this size is not meeting in somebody's house. They're just not. There's, the, the house isn't going to be big enough to fit them. They're meeting in a building. And I, I say, so what? The church isn't the building. I don't recognize a building as being the church. The church is the congregation. So, you know, who cares about where you're meeting? We can meet under a tree. And we can still have church. Because the church is a congregation of believers. But um, look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read through this a little bit. Verse number 3 says, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, excuse me, 1 Timothy 5, verse number 3. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Now, I want to make note of that word honor. And I've gone over this in previous sermons about you know, honoring your father and mother. The word honor there, you know, obviously honor, you know, maybe a primary application could be respect. But that's not the only meaning of the word honor. And we're going to see that. Because when you, when you give honor to someone, and especially we'll see in this context, it's referring to taking care of them, not just, just showing respect for them. We'll get to that. But, but keep that in mind. He says, honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow, but, I mean, that's a conjunction. He's, he's still continuing this up. But if any widow have children and nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed, and desolate, trusteth in God, and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasures is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So he's saying... Okay, don't let the widows be taken into the number of the church, of, of someone that you take care of, unless they meet all these things. She has to be at least 60 years old. It says they need to be well reported for good. They, they have to have been doing good things, you know, taking care of washing the saints' feet, you know, being hospitable, raising children, all of these things. And they're saying, you know, she's not a widow indeed unless, like, she's desolate, which means all of her family is dead. Because it said earlier, you know, if, if she has children or nephews, let them take care of that person. That's their job within their family. And look, if you, if you have someone, an, an aunt or an uncle, you know, someone that's, that's widowed, 
That's part of your job as a family to help take care of that person, to help them to meet their needs because you are part of their family. And that's why the Bible is saying, you know, for those people, look, the family is going to take care of them. But people who really have nobody, you know, they're desolate. Maybe they didn't have a big family. You know, they're, they're you know, children, nephews. They don't have anybody. Okay, now we're going to look at that person. Are they over 60 years old? You know, have they been doing the good works? Are they following God? You know, then that is going to be someone who's considered to be someone that the church will take care of. And verse 11 says, But the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. Jump down to verse 16. Verse 16 reads, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged, that it may relieve, talking about the church, that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. Right? I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward what we're talking about here. And the reason why I want to point out that first verse that we read, verse 3, honor widows that are widows indeed, it goes on to explain all of that. The way that you honor them is by taking care of them. He says, because the church is charged. That is the church's responsibility to take care of the widows that are widows indeed. And if they're not a widow indeed, if they have relatives, family, then it's the family that's charged. And the family, that, that's one that's supposed to be taking care of them. Look at the next verse, verse 17. This all ties together, believe it or not, because it, the people that, will, that are in this whole house church movement, they're also against pastors being paid. And receive, you know, they'll say, oh, you're just a hireling. Oh, you just, you know, you're just preaching for money. Look, I'm not getting paid at the moment. We have a very small church. The church isn't, isn't capable of supporting me financially. But there's nothing wrong with a pastor getting paid. Just because a pastor is getting paid to do a job, and we're going to see that when we go back to the book of Acts as well. Just because a, a pastor is getting paid to do a job doesn't mean that they're preaching for money. So when you look at all those passages that talk about preachers that preach for money, that's their intent. That's why they're, pre you know, like they're withholding truth. They're preaching lies because they want more money. That's their goal. That's their agenda. But just because a person gets paid doesn't mean that, well, yeah, the only reason you do is for money. You really think that the only reason I'm doing this right now is just to make money, which I'm not even doing, or just to try to build some church to where I can just make money? I wouldn't be preaching the way that I am if that was my goal, okay? So even if I were to, to collect any kind of compensation or payment for the work that I'm doing, you know, it doesn't mean that I'm just preaching for money. Like, that's just, oh, yeah, he's just a higher. Oh, yeah, he's just preaching for money. But that's what these people will complain about. And they also are wrong about the doctrine of tithing because, you know, tithing is how the local church is supported. It's how the, it's how the man of God is supported it, and taken care of by the church. But look at the next verse, verse 17. It says, let the elders that rule well, be kind. and elders, another word for a pastor, you have the elders in the church. Let the elders that rule well, so they're ruling the church, they rule well, let them be counted worthy of double honor. That's why that word honor is important there because just as you honor the widows by taking care of their needs and taking care of them because they have no family to take care of them, the elders are to be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If you have a pastor, an elder of a church, that's doing the good work, I mean, he's dedicating himself unto the word, and to doctrine, and to preaching the gospel, and to doing all these things for God, all this work for God, hey, count him worthy of double honor, where you're taking care of him and taking care of his needs, because he's doing this work for the church and doing this work for God. Just as the Levites did the work for God and they were taken care of as far as their physical needs were concerned with the tithe, even so in the New Testament is the pastor taken care of as well, the people who are doing the work for God. Flip back to Acts chapter 6. Because verse number 2 because in verse number one, they were complaining about the widows being neglected, right? With the daily ministration of, look, we have all these widows we need to take care of. 
We got to take care of these people. And there's, you know, it's not happening. The reason why it wasn't happening is because the church had grown so much, but there wasn't enough people to help do all of the responsibilities and do all the tasks of God, uh, of the church. Excuse me. Verse number two says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So they're saying, look, we're doing this other important work. We shouldn't leave the work of God. Because look, this needs to be taken care of. The problem with the widows, it needs to be done. But the job that the 12 were doing, they're saying, is more important than this work of taking care of all the widows, which it is important and it is the church's job. They're not denying that. But they're like, well, we shouldn't you know, take time off of what we're doing in order to do this job. So they appoint people to take care of it. Verse number three says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, were they treating this job lightly? I mean, look at what they're saying. They said, look you out among you seven men of honest, do they need to be an honest person, and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Not just anybody, not just, you know, some guy that just rolled in off the street coming in and church. Look, no, find someone who's full of wisdom. Find, find this guy that's full of the Holy Ghost to do this job. You say, well, they're just taking care of the widows. Yeah, but that was still an important job in the church. But it was a different job than what, than what the 12 were doing. They were doing, you know, going out and, and preaching the gospel and doing things like that. And they're saying, we can't be doing all of these things at once. And you think about someone who's, you know, if you have an elder of a church, they're working because they have to support their family and everything else. It only makes sense. Why wouldn't you want, you know, why would you want your pastor, your elder, serving tables, so to speak, just at his other job so that he could support his family? It would make a lot more sense for the church to say, hey, you're doing the work of God. You're doing important work. You're dedicating your life to doing this. So we'll take care of you financially so that you can have food. You don't have to worry about going off and, and making your money some other way. You'll just be taken care of so that you can dedicate yourself completely to serving God. But let's keep going. I'm, I'm kind of done with that point. So I wanted to point that out because it's just come up recently and it fits right in with the chapter that we're, that we're going over tonight. But this job, even of, of taking care of the widows, those were some important attributes. So one of the people that gets chosen for this job is Stephen. Let's keep reading here in chapter 6. Because um, in verse 4 he says, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and and to the ministry of the word. They're giving out the word of God. They're preaching the gospel. So it says in verse 5, you know, the saying pleased them, and they chose out all these people. It says they, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And it lists everyone else there. Verse 6, when they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So they were ordained. They laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So because they did this, because they freed up the time for the twelve to not have to do this other work, but they could completely be dedicated to the ministry of the word and prayer, as a result of that, of adding these other men to do these other jobs within the church, they multiplied and grew even more. Verse number 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders, and miracles among the people. So Stephen, Stephen's a great guy. I mean, he says he's full of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says he's full of the Holy Ghost. He's full of faith. He was, he was doing wonders and miracles among the people. And you could say, yeah, but all he's doing is, you know, he's just, he's just helping out with the widows. That was an important job. And look, don't think that your job is just not that important in church or whatever. Stephen was a great man of God. I guarantee you he's got a great crown that's laid up for him because just from his, his martyrdom and, and his lack of backing down off of, uh, you know, from his faith. And we see here, I mean, he was, he was doing what he's supposed to be doing. Verse number 9, Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and the, of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So you have these, basically these Jews, right, from the synagogues. And they're you're fighting with them, they're disputing with them, and he's answering them. And the Bible says they're not able to, to um, resist the wisdom. Because he, that's, I mean, he was walking in the spirit, he had the spirit of God, and he's preaching God's word, and 
they just, they've got nothing to say against them. I mean, he's just confounding them with God's word, right? He's destroying them. Because they, they believe a false gospel anyways. I mean, they believe in a false religion. So he had God on his side, he had the truth on his side, and he was destroying them. So, because they couldn't beat him with words, look at what it says in verse 14. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. Pay attention to this. Because these attacks are going to be, the, the, it doesn't change. When you've got a man of God, like a Stephen, who's doing great works, he's doing wonders, he's doing miracles, he's helping out the world, you know, he's living for God and he's making a change, and he's preaching to God, he's doing all these great things for God, right? He's causing a stir just even with himself among all these other great men of God. Well, at first they try to, they try to beat him with words, they can't do that because he's got the truth. So then they hire people, they suborn men, it says, to, to say, oh yeah, he's preaching against Moses. So now they're going to try to get him in trouble with the law. And as a Christian, if you're going to stand up for God and, and do great things for him, you better expect this. That, you know, at first they might try to attack you with words, but if you've got the truth on your side and you're speaking wisdom, they can't, they can't do anything about it. They realize they're just shut down because they don't got the truth. They're going to come and try to get you at the law. And this is what they're doing here. And they stir up the people and they get everyone, you know, get the crowds all angry and mad. And we see this over and over again. I mean, we've experienced a little tiny bit of that when someone online went and stirred up a bunch of people saying, oh yeah, you're a hate group and all this other stuff. And, you know, trying to get everyone just angry and riled up against us. And, you know, the phone calls and the emails and everything else. It's, this is the way the world operates. This is the way Satan operates. He's going to attack. And this is the way he does it. And, and this hasn't changed. This is timeless. So they bring him to the council, and it says in verse 13, and set up false witnesses. Does it sound familiar? They did the same thing to Jesus. People are just going to lie about you. And again, with these days with the internet, look at all the slander that's out there. Don't believe everything you see online, okay? Especially when it talks about somebody's character. I mean, it, oh, it, there's people I know, I know personally, and it's like you read stuff, and it's like, where do you come up with that stuff? Or read stuff about myself, like, it's just total fabrication. But people will put it out and they're like, oh, I grew up with this person. I know them and they did this and they did that. It's like, I don't even know who you are. But they do that because other people look at them like, oh, wow, yeah, see, this guy really, he's no good. You know, this person's exposing him and stuff. Don't believe everything that you see online. There are plenty, I mean, especially someone who's doing a good work for God. There are a lot of people that are going to be setting up false witnesses to lie, to slander their name, to drag them through the mud. And it's, you can't answer to all these people either. You know, if you're, if you're the guy that's, that's being slandered and having fault, you can't respond to all that. There's too much of it. And it's not even worth your time. Because all they're going to try to do is trip you up in your words anyways. But, um, you know, you just let your actions speak for themselves. You let your words speak for themselves. And you just do what you're doing and keep serving God. You don't have to keep on getting sidetracked with all these other attacks against you. So it says, they set up false witnesses in verse 13. Um, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against the whole, this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. So they look at him. I mean, in this, I mean, Stephen's just in the spirit. They look at him just like they're looking at an angel. And that's when, and, and you know, I'm not going to go through all of chapter 7. We read the whole thing, but I'm going to cover a lot of the highlights of it. So in chapter 7, that's where he starts off, and the high priest says, well, look, is this true? Right? The things these guys are saying against you, is that true? And that's when he starts his sermon. And he starts answering. Basically, he gives them this history. He starts telling them about Abraham. And Abraham received the promise. And it starts, as he's going on, this is nothing that is contrary to what they profess to believe, right? He's giving them the history of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of, you know, Moses, and he starts to go in this. But as he's telling the stories, what's interesting is, is as he progresses through his sermon, there's parts that are included in his story that show the, the um, 
resistance of the people. Because he ends up making this great point that they're just like the people that resisted Moses. Right? Because in, even in Moses' day, he, he met with a lot of people. You know, Moses was there to free the people, to free them from their bondage, to get them out of the land of Egypt, to show them the ways of God. He was a righteous leader, showing them the truth. But a lot of the people, the very people he was saving, were turning against him and saying, you know, and just, and just wanting to do their own thing and lying about him and resisting him and how many times, like there's multiple times where like they were ready to put Moses and Aaron to death. They were ready to kill him. It's like Moses is interceding for them that they wouldn't die to God who wanted to kill him and they're going back and saying, yeah, let's, you know, let's go back in Egypt. Let's kill these guys. Let's get them out of here. And that hasn't changed either. And what Stephen ends up doing is saying, you're just like, you're just like your fathers that were doing the same thing to them. But they don't get that. Let's look at um, we're going to skip so because he goes over Joseph being taken um, being sold into bondage and how you know Israel came into the land and there they, they dwelt until you know a king arose that didn't know Joseph and brought him into bondage and everything else. So then Moses was born and um, when he becomes 40 years old, he goes out to try to, to try to lead the, you know, try to show the people that he's there to deliver them. And he sees his, he sees a, uh, an Egyptian wronging a Hebrew, right? He sees him do, you know, just treat him bad. And it says that, um, you know, he suffered wrong in verse 24 of chapter 7. He defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote. He kills this Egyptian man. He kills him with his bare hand. He like buries him in the sand or whatever. And he's thinking like, okay, I got, you know, hopefully now that Hebrew saw, hey, I'm here to stand up for you against this oppression. I'm here to lead you out of this. But that's not the way they took it because the next day when he saw his own, you know, two Hebrews fighting against each other, he's like, wait, wait, you know, like, what are you guys doing? You know, we're supposed to be brethren, you know, you're trying to make peace with them. And the one guy's like, well, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? And just as with Moses, it's the same way today. Moses was a righteous man of God, right? I mean, Moses was someone, he was there, he was appointed by God to lead them and deliver them out of the promise, or out of, out of the promise, out of the, out of Egypt out of the bondage. He was there trying to show them the right way. But as we get today, I mean, how often do you hear people say, oh, don't judge. Oh, don't judge. Who made you a judge? Why are you judging me? And it's always coming from people who are in, like, serious sin. You know, the people who are living in fornication, oh, who are you to judge? Right? And especially from, like, the Sodom, like, oh, you, you can't judge. The Bible says you're not supposed to judge. Yeah. It says, judge not that you be not judged. It doesn't just say, judge not. It says, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. The Bible is saying, don't be a hypocrite when you judge. If I'm not involved in fornication and I'm judging someone in fornication, I'm not a hypocrite because I'm not doing the same thing that I'm, that I'm judging you of. And besides, if I'm judging, I'm, I'm not judging just based on my own opinion, just my own thought. Well, I just think that that's wrong and you shouldn't do that. It's off of God's word. If God's word says something, hey, that's the truth. Amen. Right? I don't, I don't need, I'm not relying on my own wisdom. I could just open up this book and say, look, thus saith the Lord. You don't even have to say it's my words. God says that that's a sin. But people that are doing those sins, they don't want to hear that. So they respond the same way that, that this guy did who was doing his, his brother wrong, saying, well, who made you a ruler and a judge over me? And that's the rebellious attitude that you see over and over and over again throughout the children of Israel, even as they're being delivered from the bondage. Even when they're out in the wilderness. They don't like having a ruler over them. They don't want to obey the, God's laws. But when you have a righteous man of God who's just preaching God's word as Moses did, this is what you're going to see. And this is the same thing that Stephen was encountering, encountering as well. So he brings this up about Moses. And then it says, um, 
you know, so they said, oh, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? And at that, he got scared because he thought he'd gotten away with that. When he killed that guy, he's like, wait a minute, people actually know about this? So he gets out of town because Pharaoh looks for, you know, if Pharaoh wants him dead, he's like, you know, even though he was brought up in Pharaoh's house, when he was found out that he murdered an Egyptian, Pharaoh's like, look, you know, we're going to get this guy. So he, he ran off and, and was gone for 40 years before he came back. And it says in verse 30, And when the 40 years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. So it talks about the burning bush and saying that God had met him and that, um, you know, that he's sent to deliver the people of Egypt. And um, I want to point out, look at verse 30, look at verse 34. The Bible says, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning and am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. So they're saying, you know, these people who were rejecting Moses, saying, Who made you a ruler? Well, you know what? God's the one that made him a ruler and a judge. That's basically what he's saying. God's the one that gave him that judge. So just because someone's saying, Oh, who made, you know, who are you to judge? Well, God's even appointed us. He says, you know, that we should judge righteous judgment. And he says, know ye not, what? Know you not that you shall judge the angels? And he's talking about, you know, within the church, especially, you know, and you can't judge the smallest of matters within the church? I mean, how in the world are we not supposed to judge? The, the Bible gives us criteria of when someone, when a brother in Christ is in sin like drunkenness, or as an extortioner, that, that you need to kick them out of the assembly. That they need to, they're not allowed in church. Well, how can you do that unless you judge that person? Right? I mean, you have to judge. You have to do this stuff. And it's righteous judgment that God has appointed us to do. Now look, I don't go around just getting into everybody's business and just telling every little thing that you're doing wrong. Okay? But the things that God says are a sin, they're going to be preached and in order for anyone to make a change for the, for the better, they need to hear about it. Because believe it or not, there's some people that don't have that attitude of just, well, who are you to judge? Some people will actually, listen, a wise man will hear. They'll take the rebuke and they'll, and they'll, they'll maybe have godly sorrow that's going to lead them to repentance and they'll change. And that's the attitude that we ought to have. But we see here a little bit earlier, because they're going to get really angry real soon at Stephen for preaching this stuff. But they're not angry just yet. He points out, he's saying, well, look, God's the one, because, hey, they're all for Moses, right? At least that's what they say. They're like, yeah, that's right. You know, God is the one that appointed him to be a ruler and a judge. But they don't realize just yet that he's going to apply <laughs> them to be those very same people that are saying, who made thee a ruler and judge? Because that's the way they responded to Christ. Who made you to be a ruler? Who made you the Christ? When they rejected Christ, it's just like these people who rejected Moses. They don't see that quite yet, but as soon as he makes that point crystal clear, they get real angry about that. Verse 37 says, This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, Prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. So now he's talking about the prophecy that Moses gave of Jesus Christ that was to come. Because again, he's, at, he's, he's, he's trying to get them. They believe in Moses, right? Hey, if you believe in Moses so much. You claim to believe in Moses. Moses said, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of, all, of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, with your fa and with your fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turn back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. So he's saying, you know, this is that Moses, he made this promise, and he's the very same man that, 
the children, they, they turn in their hearts back to Egypt. And they're saying, yeah, the Mo and we were just talking about this before service. It's funny. We're, we're talking about this very same story that Moses goes up into the mountain, you know, for 40 days and 40 nights. And he comes down and it's like, you know, the children of Israel are just like, hey, yeah, we don't know what happened to that Moses guy, Aaron. You know, make us, make us our God. Make us an idol. So he makes them the golden calf and they're, you know, fornicating and having this big party and, you know, and all this, all this stuff is going on. And we're, you know, we're talking about this. We're saying, how is it? How is it that the same people that came out of Egypt, they saw the plagues that were done against Pharaoh and his people. They saw the great hail and the, and the flies and all this stuff going on to Pharaoh. The, the, the miracles of God. And then they come out and they have the, the pillar of fire and the cloud of smoke. And then they see the Red Sea parted. The, the water standing on either side in dry ground in the middle of the sea. And they cross right through it on both sides. They see the water. They cross through, get over on dry land, and then they see God bring that back down on the armies of the Egyptians and destroy them. They see all of that. And within 40 days, 40 days, they're just like, yeah, well, what happened to that Moses guy? I don't know. And they, Moses was the one leading them through. But think about this. Jesus Christ was on this earth performing way more miracles than Moses was. Jesus Christ was casting out devils. Jesus Christ was healing the sick. Jesus Christ was walking on water. Jesus Christ was raising the dead back to life. And you say, well, how, how can someone see all that? And just like, the fair, just like their fathers, they rejected Christ. The same people. It's the same type of person. And what's funny is that these, the Pharisees don't see it that way. They don't see it as them being the ones that would be you know, turning to the idols. But that's exactly who they are. That's exactly who they are. They're the people that are rejecting Moses. They claim you know, years and years and years later, oh yeah, we wouldn't have been like those people. But that's exactly who they are. And they proved it by rejecting Jesus. That, it still boggles my mind to think about that. How could you... And you know what? They went a step further. Not only did they not believe on Jesus, they said that what he's doing is of the devil. As he's healing and as he's preaching God's word. Oh yeah, that's the devil. Excuse me? But let, this, this, gets, this gets real good here because he's... He's about, he's about to turn it on them. He's about to lay it on them and, and let them see that. And look, Stephen is a great example of how a preacher should be. He's given them the facts. Notice, he's quoting Scripture. When he's telling them these stories, there are direct quotes from the Bible. And this is, remember, this is Stephen just speaking. Okay? Stephen was a man that had Bible scripture memorized. He, I'm sure he wasn't pulling out a parchment and trying, you know, reading to him when they brought him before the council. He's quoting God's word unto him. He's giving them the backstory. He's giving them the information that they need to know. He's telling, look, goes through the history. Abraham, Moses, all this stuff is happening. Giving them the, the lowdown. Everything's true. And then he starts to make the application. He quotes God's word. And then he gets into the application. So he talks about the people rejecting um, Moses and making the calf. And, oh, verse 30, 43 says, Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan. If you're wondering where that star of David came from, this is where it came from. When they took up the star of their god Remphan. You try to look up through the history of that, that the quote-unquote star of David didn't have a star. There's nothing referred about that in the Bible anywhere in God's word. But there is the star of Remphan. When they, when they went off and started, and started following these idols and these false gods. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses. And then he goes on about the tabernacle and how God is greater than that and he doesn't need to, to live in a, you know, in a dwelling made with hands. Um, verse 51 look at verse 51 
Bible reads, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So now he's, he's, he's turning on him and saying, look, this is who you are. You are uncircumcised in heart and your ears. You're not willing to hear the truth and you're not willing to turn your heart unto God. And, you know, I want to point this out too real briefly because this is a great point. For, for people who believe in Calvinism, you know, that believe in this tulip, one of the points of tulip is irresistible grace. When they believe that, that someone is saved because God just draws, hey, look, if God's drawing that person, there's no way you can resist it. It's irresistible. They are getting saved no matter what. That's what they teach and they believe. Then why does the Bible say right here that these people were resisting the Holy Ghost? If it's not even possible, if, you know, if it's irresistible grace, how can they be resisting the Holy Ghost? It's stupidity. Of course you could resist the Holy Ghost. These people did it. Stephen's calling them out for it, saying, look, you're uncircumcised in heart. You're uncircumcised in ears. You're not receiving the truth. You're resisting the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. All the way up to that point, they were listening to what he had to say. And then he got real serious with them saying, look, this is who you are. You are just like your fathers. Because, and look, all throughout history, all throughout the Bible, the prophets of God have been persecuted even by their own people. They have, got, they have been persecuted. They've received all kinds of, you know, a lot of people. You, you know, if you look, I'm not going to turn there, but look at Hebrews chapter 11. You look at the faith chapter. And it talks about the persecutions. It talks about people being sawn asunder and people you know, suffering for the cause of Christ and so showing that um, you know, they're not willing, that, that they're, they're looking for a better resurrection, basically. And he calls them out and he says, um, you know, that you have murdered the just one. The same one that Moses prophesied, you claim to believe in Moses, you murdered the just one, the one that was supposed to come and, and that Moses prophesied about. You sit down. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. They got infuriated. Isn't it interesting how the word of God will do that? All the word of God that, that, that he's preaching to him. And when he finally points out, like for a while they're okay with it. And it's like, wait, no, that's you. You are that person. You are the one that's against Christ. You are the one that's against the Lord. It cuts them right to the heart. God's word is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. God's word can pierce and divide asunder even in the dividing of the soul and spirit. Stephen is a, is a man of God full of the Holy Ghost and he pierces through to their heart. But they hear this and they, and they just can't even deal with it anymore. So it says that they gnashed on him with their teeth. I mean, they're just, just saying all kinds of horrible things. And then verse 55, it says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. So they're, I mean, they're infuriated. But Stephen stands there, he looks up, looks up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God in Jesus standing on the right. What a sight to behold! He looks up in heaven. He sees God's glory, he sees His great brightness, and he sees Jesus standing on the right hand. What an amazing sight. What, look, this, is, this is Stephen. We read, he's, he's in the Bible for one chapter and a little portion of chapter 6. And what a great man of God. Look, people who are even very little mentioned in the Bible have done all kinds of great things. Think about the 12 disciples. How many do you really hear about? You know, Peter, James, John, right? You hear about Thomas once. That's not the best of references, right? You hear about some other people. But, but seriously, even Thomas, though, like, he was one of the disciples. He stuck with Jesus the whole time. And he did great work for him. Stop doing that. He did all kinds of great... My point with that is just that, you know, you don't have to be the most well-known person to be doing great works for God. And Stephen did all kinds of great work. We, we need to be looking at these great preachers and great prophets as examples and someone that we need to be modeling our life after. And 
know what to expect. Okay, if you're going to stand up and preach God's word and preach it uncensored and make the application where necessary, hey, is it going to ruffle some feathers? You betcha. Are people going to get angry about it? Yeah. But as Stephen did, we're still going to preach it. We're still going to say it like it is because it needs to be said and it needs to be heard. He looks up into heaven. He sees this great vision. And he, and he says, in verse 56, it said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He, I mean, he can't even keep his mouth. He's like, I, this is what I see right now. Then they cried out with a loud voice. Look at this. They cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Like little infant children. They go, la, 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 I can't hear you. They stopped their ears. They're like, I don't want to hear any more of this. They, they were maddened. They couldn't take it. They couldn't take the truth. And they ran on him. And they cast him out of the city, it says, and stoned him. And they, they, they whipped rocks at him and killed him. Because of the things that he said. It infuriated him so much. People aren't any different today. The same, people have the same flesh. People, there are still people out there that do not want to hear God's word. But just because they don't want to hear it doesn't mean that we need to be silent about it. Too many people, I think, have gotten afraid because they know this to be true. And they don't want to deal with something like this. They don't want to say, well, I'm not going to stick my life. You know, I've, I've heard my own, you know, some, some relatives and people saying, you know, like, well, why does, you know, I don't think it's safe, you know, to go to this church because, you know, your pastor is saying all of these things. Well, look, God didn't promise everyone to be safe. Some people are going to be martyred. That's true. But I'd much rather live a much shorter life as Stephen did. But do it in God's will. Now look, did God have, the, he saw God. He saw Jesus saying, right? Didn't God have the power to protect him if he wanted, if, if he wanted Stephen to stay alive? Don't you believe that God could have sent his angels to make sure that they didn't kill him then? Of course he did. Jesus Christ, when they wanted to kill him, because it wasn't his time, it wasn't allowed to happen. Even though they really wanted to do it. Remember when he walked through the midst of them? When they were ready to, to, to throw him off a cliff and he just he walked through? It wasn't allowed to happen. God can make these things not happen. But God allowed this to happen. He allowed him to be martyred. And there's a very important reason for this. And we don't always know what the reasons are. We can't always see why or why. You know, no one wants to like go through persecution and tribulation. It's not like I and you are like, hey, yeah, I can't wait. I hope I just get beat up and you know, thrown in jail and all this stuff. Like, you don't want, you know, you're not wishing for that to happen. But if it does, because you're doing the right thing, because you're walking in the spirit, because you're preaching God's word, then hey, I'm just gonna trust God with it. Whatever He wants me to be doing with my life, I'm not gonna try to run from that or avoid it because maybe it's dangerous. God can protect us, or God can allow these things to happen, but when He allowed this to happen, you know, not many people might know this about Stephen, because he's not talked about very much in the Bible. But how many people have heard about the Apostle Paul? Apostle Paul was at this event. Look at verse number 58. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Saul is who the Apostle Paul was prior to his conversion. His name is Saul. He was enabling those that, that murdered Stephen. He was covering up for him. He received the, the garments to, to hide him so that, you know, when Inquisition's made, oh, I don't know, you know, no one knows what happened. There's no one to, to, to judge, right? Saul was consenting unto his death. Look at verse 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. And another great verse to prove the deity of Christ from Scripture. They stoned Stephen, calling upon who? Calling upon God. What did he say? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Jesus Christ is God. He was calling on God and he said, Lord Jesus. Receive my spirit. 
And he kneeled down and cried. And look at this with a loud voice. Look at the spirit that Stephen had. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. He's preaching a hard message. You can say, oh yeah, Stephen's full of hate. He hated those people because he said these things. Why would he call them murderers and all this other stuff? And they rejected Christ and they murdered Christ. He said it because it's the truth. But did he have hate in his heart toward him? No. He said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. As they're killing him. They're pelting him with rocks so that he dies. And while he's in the middle of this saying, God, don't lay this sin to their charge. Just like Jesus said when he was on the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. It's the spirit of Christ that Stephen had at this moment. One of the things that made him such a great man. Think about the person, this person Saul, that witnessed this. He sees a man getting killed for what he believes. Getting killed unrighteously. He didn't say or do anything wrong. Not even according to their law. He didn't do anything wrong. Stood up. Didn't back down. Proclaimed the truth. And was even had the heart to say, God forgive them. To have that type of love on them. I guarantee you that made an impact in, in this young man Saul's life. I really don't doubt that this was one of the reasons that one of the things that prompted his conversion that that got him to believe in the truth otherwise why would it even mention that why does the Bible even mention that oh yeah this guy Saul was there and, he, and, and you know he was a witness to this this great event this great testimony this great preaching from Stephen Stephen the martyr great man of God As Stephen had pointed out, you know, all the prophets suffered persecution. He said all the prophets, they, they were suffering that persecution. You know, so don't be ashamed when the attacks come. Whether it's for the things that you say, or whether it's for the things that your pastor says, or your friend says, or something like that. Look, because people will attack you. Even if you're not the one saying, well, wait, I know you go to this church. Or I know that you're friends with this guy. Did you know that he said this? And a lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll back down. Oh, I don't know why he said that. And, you know, look, don't be afraid. The persecution is going to come. If you're, if you're preaching the truth, it's going to happen. People get angry at it. That's okay. We know what happened. We know who wins in the end, first of all. We, we know that. We know that. We know the end of the matter. But not only that, not backing down is huge for your when you back down you ruin your testimony when you say you believe one thing and then you back down later it's just like all of these phonies they, they, you know you'll have the people in in sports and in hollywood and they'll they'll say they'll criticize the the homosexuals right they'll say oh man i think that's disgusting i think that's weird you know i never want to have any homos you know in, in the locker room with me and all those because they're normal guys right they're just saying look i think that's weird i think that's perverted i think that's disgusting but then what happens? They get attacked, right? They get attacked because that agenda, they hate hearing that. The Sodomites hate it. They, they want to stop their ears and just rush on them and get them to stop and do whatever it takes to get them to stop. But when you don't just stand up to that and you just back down, oh, well, I'm sorry. Look, it makes you look like a fool. And you think that they're going to lay off you anyways? No, they're still going to ruin you. Because you said anything to begin with, they're going to want to make an example out of you. And now you've gone and ruined your own credibility and you still lost your income or whatever it is because of it. But people get, get scared and they back down. We need to, to make sure that we have the boldness of Stephen. Stephen had his boldness because he was walking in the Spirit, because he was doing the right thing. God's Spirit gives you that courage and gives you that boldness. We, need, we ought to have the same courage as him don't back down from, these, from the haters that want to try to silence you and silence the Word of God. We need to proclaim it now louder than ever. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great example of Stephen, dear Lord, in the Bible, that he had such a great spirit on him and he was able to just boldly 
preach the word, dear God, and, and not be ashamed and not be worried about the consequences, and that he even had the spirit about him to forgive those that were, that were killing him. Lord, help us to have that same type of a spirit where we can love our enemies and, and pray for them, dear Lord. Pray for them which despitefully use us. And um, all the while, not softening the message, not taking anything out, not trying to trim it so that we don't, you know, we don't face persecution, dear God, but we just give the uncensored, unfiltered truth from your word, dear God. Help us to have more knowledge and more learning, dear Lord, that we can be used mightily by you in these last days. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.